Good morning and welcome to Faith Family Church. We're so thrilled that you're here today. Here's a quick look at what's going on at the church. We are still raising money for our church building fund. Anything you give will be greatly appreciated and we'll know that God will bless your giving. Join us for a corporate prayer in the fellowship hall each Sunday before service starting at 10 o'clock. There is always free coffee and something sweet in the Welcome Center before service. If this is your first time here, we would like to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us today. Please take a minute to fill out a visitor's card and drop it in the offering basket so we can get to know you. We would love to connect with you. Please take a moment to text and save the number on the screen to receive updates about what's going on at the church as well as a place for you to send prayer requests, connect with a member of the leadership team, and ask any questions you may have. Holy Communion is available to everyone and may be taken at any time during the service. The nursery is available during every service for children newborn through two years old. If you're three years old through fifth grade, we would love for you to join us with Faith Kids every Sunday during the service. We'd love for you to join the Call of the Faithful every Tuesday and Thursday morning. For more information, pick up a flyer in the foyer. Join us this Wednesday night for dinner and Bible study starting at 530. Ladies, if you are interested in attending the Boots and Jeans Steppin' for Jesus on June 29th, please speak with Debbie Ferris or Debbie Oswald for more information. And welcome to Faith Family Church. We're glad you came this morning, and we welcome all the visitors. And I've heard there's a birthday in the house. Miss Kim Goodman, wherever you're at, happy birthday. And may you have many more. Oh. Je oh. Birthday's in the house. Oh, it sounds like June's a good month. June's a good month. I got one coming soon, too. So June's a good month, but you know, even better than the month of the year is our Lord and our Savior. You know, when we come into his house and we can love on him, we know that God has an ultimate plan for each one of us in this place. Sometimes we feel down, sometimes we feel out, but I'm telling you, when you reach up and touch the hem of his garment, you'll know that you've been in the presence of God. So I invite you this morning to allow God to just minister to your heart. Drop all that baggage that you brought, leave it behind, and ask God to just give you grace to walk where he wants you to walk. So as we come this morning, I ask that God, you would just be in us and through us, work through us, Father God, that your plan, your purpose would go forth in this place. Father, we thank you for who you are. And, Father, we never want to forget Jesus who went to the cross for each one of us. Father, may we always remember that. And, Holy Spirit, we welcome you this morning. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Be, the, be our ultimate, God. We just thank you for who you are. And we praise you, God, for what you've done in this place and what you're going to do, continue to do in this place. 
And Father, we thank you for the praises, Father God, that we've seen, that the miracles that you're doing. And Father, we just give you the authority to just have your way in this place today. Have your way in this place, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with us today?
Does it really matter? I just.
I'm c a l l i n 
Can you make that declaration? Can you make that declaration from your heart? You know, we sing the words and we're moved by his presence. But I have to repent because there's times that I seek his face and I run to him when I'm struggling. I run to him when I have needs. I run to him on behalf of other people because I, I, I just want God to do something. I want him to move. I want his word fulfilled. But this morning, I believe what the Spirit of God is saying is anything else, anything, can you put all of that aside? Can you, can you just lay all that down and just want me for me, for who I am? Is that your heart's desire? Is it your desire just for Him? Because I can tell you there's times I just repent, God, for the times I've come to you because I've needed something, because I've been desperate or I've felt hopeless or I've felt overwhelmed by the things of this world and things that I can't work out. Or And there have been good things. It's been, I mean, as far as it's been a good reason to go to him because there's things going on that only he can do something about because of who he is. But I think about my own kids, and, and, and I'm not throwing them under the bus this morning because we've all been there that our kids come to us, even when they're little Billy, because they have needs. They need to be fed. They, need, they, they can't do for themselves, and they come to us, and it's precious, and, and we love them, and we'll meet those needs. But I think God's saying, can you just come to me because you want me, because you want to spend time with me, how precious it is. And as I get older and then I have the grandbabies and then and, and my own grown children, and they don't want nothing. They just want to spend time with me. They just enjoy the company of, of being around me. How the Father longs how he longs for his children to just come to him and cry out to him not for what he can do although he will and he's faithful and he's good but just because we want him just like the song they just sang give me Jesus I don't want anything else if you never do another thing for me I still want you I still want to go into my secret place and I, I, I'll wait on you. I don't have to have all these goosebumps and this overwhelming feeling to begin with because I know, I know what your word says. That when I seek you, I will find you. When I go for you, you will be there. And I don't have to have this overwhelming feeling a sense of his presence although this girl loves that I love feeling his presence and he's here this morning and I feel like the word says when Jesus tells the story that he's knocking I feel like he's knocking this morning he's knocking on our hearts he's knocking and he says if we would just open the door that he will come in. He will come in and so he stands and he knocks. And I believe that he's knocking this morning. And he knows our needs, he knows, the word says he knows what we have need of before we ask. Because he knows the end from the beginning. So we haven't gotten to tomorrow yet, but he knows what's there and he knows what we're gonna need. But that's not what I'm talking about this morning. I feel like the spirit of the Lord saying I'm knocking and yes, I believe, and if it's, if it's not everyone, then we're going to pray for the ones that want to say, I want him to be the Lord of my life. But I believe most of us in this place have said, I, I've, I've prayed the sinner's prayer, and he is my Lord. But my husband, when he was preaching on a regular basis, would say it all the time. If he is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And I think so many times we put the stuff and the needs and, and he is good and he's faithful and he says, ask and you shall receive and you have not because you ask not. And, but that's not what he's saying this morning. He's saying, I'm knocking on your heart. And I want so much to come in and my presence 
and my goodness goes far beyond anything you've tasted yet. The word says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And some of us have had a taste. And some of us at times when we come in here on Sundays or in our personal prayer time, we have tasted him. And we felt the overwhelming presence of God that just, that presence that just like, you just can't get up and go. You just want to sit in his presence or stand or kneel. Or It's like, it's overwhelming. And that's what he wants for us all the time. But you know what? We haven't exhausted his presence. We haven't achieved his presence in saying that this is the maximum. There is no end to him. So if you would with me this morning, if there's anyone in the house that has never, never asked the Lord to be your Savior, now's your opportunity. Now's your opportunity. Just say, Lord, if you'll pray with me. Say, Lord, I come to you this morning, and I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on that cross for my sins and I receive you as my Lord and Savior help me Lord lead me and guide me and show me Father God the way the Jesus way Lord, lead me. Those that, that, that prayed that prayer, and it's not the first time that they prayed it, but God, their, their desire is for, for a greater revelation of you, that they can, they can acknowledge you in all their ways. That's like in everything that we do, God, that we acknowledge you, that we come to you, and we don't just jump up, get on our way, and not give you a second thought, but that we are ever mindful of your presence in our life that you're not just part of our life, but you are our life. You're everything. You are truly everything. Lord, I repent for the times that I've come to you just wanting something, even when I've been desperate. And, and, and my loved ones or myself or our family and friends, they, they've needed a miracle, but I, I've come just rushing in saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. Lord, I'm believing, I'm standing, I'm praying, I'm trying to do all the, ticking all the boxes, doing everything to see this manifest. God, forgive me when that's been my main motive of seeking you. I want you more than the stuff. I want you more than what you can do for me. I just want you. If, you, if that's you this morning, just tell them in your own words. Tell him what he means to you. And, and, and maybe you need to do like me. Repent and say, God, I'm sorry when I've done it the wrong way. I want you and I trust you and I need you. And I believe, Father God, and trust that what you have for me is greater than anything that I've ever asked or imagined. Just in your presence. In your presence, God thank you. I just have to thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for dying for me for taking the, the punishment for my sins. Thank you for being rejected that I could be received to the Father. Thank you for laying your life down. Thank you for the, for the beating that you took, the humiliation, the shame that I deserved, but you took it because of your love. Thank you. God, I just thank you. I thank you for your presence this morning. I thank you. Thank you. I love you, Lord. Thank you for being here. Whew. As I was praying about coming and doing the transition the morning, this morning, I was like 
telling the Lord, help me remember this, help me remember that, help me. None of that matters right now. None of it matters. Just Him. If we can just look on Him, look on Him and not, He's got the rest of it because He's good and He loves us. Lord, I love you this morning. Can you just tell Him how much you love Him? Can you just say, Lord, I just love you. I love you this morning. I love you. Thank you for receiving us as your sons and daughters. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Somewhere, Stephen's in the house. Glory to God. There he is. If you'll make Pastor Steve Red, Stephen ready, welcome this morning. I know he's ready. Glory to God. I love y'all. Hello, there we are. All right. Good morning. Oh. Thank you for uh, coming and being with us this morning. Before we get into the word this morning, I just I'm gonna say some stuff. Um, I've prayed really hard this week about today. Um, I even reached out to other people and asked them specifically to pray for today, to pray for me throughout the week um, about what we're gonna talk about today. I didn't tell anyone necessarily what we were talking about. I just told people I needed prayer. I wanted prayer. I craved prayer. I prayed all week long. I want you guys to know something. I never wanted this. I literally, I used to tell God that I will do anything for him except this. I did not, never wanted to be in the position that I'm in doing what I'm doing. I'm honored to do it. I love each and every one of you, and I'm thrilled that you're here. But I was literally just kind of forced into this. And I love it. I love doing this for him. I recognize that um, I say things that challenge you, a lot, I'm sure, and that he gives me things to tell you that are not always the easiest to hear and to accept. And I have had many conversations with him where I've asked him, why does he make me say these things and why do I have to be the one to say the words that I say? All I can tell you is this. I will say what he tells me to say no matter what it costs me. I, I, I care about each and every one of you. I love each and every one of you. We have guests in the house this morning. I haven't met yet, but I'm telling you, I'd lay my life down for you, honestly. Like, he has put a love of, for people in me that I've never experienced before. I'm so thrilled that you're all here. I consider you not only friends, but family. But if it costs me my family, if it costs me my wife, my kids, my mom, my dad, whatever it costs, if it costs me everything to do what he's asked me to do and to serve him the way he's asked me to serve him, I will do it. I don't care how, I don't care how anyone else views it or how anyone else looks at it. I only care about what he says and what he thinks. I want y'all to know that from the bottom of my heart. And I'm not saying this to brag. It's not a brag. I am telling you 
from the bottom of my heart that I am willing to sacrifice everything for Jesus. Everything. He means that much to me. Okay? This week, I was praying. I was like, God, there are things that we're going to talk about this week, and I don't know how it's going to go. And literally, I told him at one point, I said, God, if this is all just me, if this is just me thinking these things, putting these things on this paper, if this is just me, then number one, like don't have, have no one show up Sunday. If no one shows up Sunday, then I'm like, cool, like they weren't going to hear any truth anyway, so I'm glad they didn't come. Or if they come and have the worship go well, but then don't even give me the mic. Like at whoever is leading the service, just move on their heart to just dismiss and be done and we'll call it a day, and I'm okay with that too, because I don't want to say things up here that aren't him. I don't. I promise I don't. I'm going to charge the two of you right now. If I start saying stuff that you don't agree with, stop me. I'm okay with it. I don't want this to be me. I don't. I want it to be him. But I understand that our understanding of him and our version of him is not always who he really is. And we have to be willing to accept that. You have to be willing to accept that, that your understanding of him so far isn't right. You with me? Here's what I would say. If you are here today, and I, don't get me wrong, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm being as genuine as possible, and I'm not in any way being hateful. If you came here today to tick a box, you've done your job, you can go. You don't have to be here for what I'm about to say. I promise, you're not gonna hurt my feelings, you're not gonna offend me. Anybody in this room, if you stay, I want it to be because you genuinely want to see Jesus better and you want, to un- you want to understand who he is and what he wants for you and that you are saying by staying, God, I am willing to make changes in my life Changes in my life if I'm not living according to you. That's why you're here. That's why you're in the room. Again, don't worry about what anyone else thinks, what anyone, like, this is a you and him moment right now. If you can genuinely look inward and say, Jesus, all I care about is you, all I want is you, there is nothing else but you, and I will, if, if I come up against anything that is not you, I'll change. If you can do that, then please stay and hear the word that I believe God has for you, okay? Okay. And I'm sorry, I know that was a really intense way to start a message, but I need y'all to, I need y'all to know how sincere I am. It has been a very, very sobering week where I've had a, a lot of really, really deep conversations with our Savior. I don't know for sure, but it would not surprise me if today is the final week of our series. It, would, it wouldn't surprise me just because of what it is that we're talking about and how this all kind of culminates. Um, our series has been going on for a while. You quote it, but do you know it? We are continuing it today. But as I was getting things ready for today, I kept seeing these things. Things kept jumping out to me, and I'm like, man, if this is it, what a crescendo. Um, it also may be the last message I ever preach in front of you guys, so that, but that's okay too. It's his words, not mine. In the very first week of this series, does anyone remember the very first? You quote it, but do you know it? Matthew 7, 12. What's Matthew 7, 12? Do unto others as you would have them do to you, the golden rule. If you did not see that message and you're curious about what the contents of it were, it's on YouTube, it's on Facebook, you can watch it. Um, Going through this week, I kept seeing all these like connections back to other things. The last three weeks, two weeks ago, we talked about Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Last week, we talked about the fact that no one can serve two masters, right? Right? And so then, as we get into today, 
we have another popularly, regularly quoted verse. Are y'all ready? Joshua 24, 15. Anybody? Jo- huh? Oh, he showed it? <laughs> okay. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. How many of y'all have heard this before? How many of you have said this before? How many of you used to ha- maybe had or have a decorative version of this hanging on a wall somewhere in your house. Yeah. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But that's not what Joshua 24, 15 says. Joshua 24, 15 says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the, gods of your ans- whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Joshua 24 is the last chapter in the book of Joshua. After Joshua gives this speech, Joshua dies. I want to look at this in context like I enjoy doing. We're going to have two pretty decently large scripture readings today, and then I'm just going to talk to y'all. And I wrote down a lot of notes this week because I didn't want to I didn't want to say Stephen words. I wanted to say God words. So things that he gave me this week, I wrote them down, so I'll probably be referring to my notes a lot today because I don't want to mess this up. I'm very aware that this is his message and not mine. So if you have your Bibles, Joshua 24, verse 1, it says this. Then Joshua assembled the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, our, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, believed, I'm sorry, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron and afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there and brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots. And horsemen as far as the Red Sea, but they, cared, but they cried to the Lord for help. And he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam, so he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites, but I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, and dro- which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities you did not build, and you live in them, and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now fear the Lord and serve him with, faith, with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods, of your ans- the, the, the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, 
whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it for us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who had lived, who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord, our God, and obey him. They set up a memorial and that's, that's how Joshua ends. Joshua dies. Choose, choose. This isn't the first time that Israel's heard these words though. Did y'all know that? How many of you have heard that, expre- or heard that verse, choose this day who you will serve, right? This isn't the first time that Israel's been given this ultimatum. Joshua gives it to them, but their previous leader, Moses, told them the same thing. If you have your Bibles, flip over to the book of Deuteronomy. It's one book back, chapter 30. In Deuteronomy 29, Moses, once again, he renews the covenant between God and Israel, okay? And then Moses speaks to the people. In verse 19, we have, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. How many of y'all have heard this before? Set before you, life, death, blessings, cursings, choose life, right? Okay, if you back up to the beginning of the chapter, it says, when all these blessings and cursings I have set before you come on you and, uh, and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you, even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens. From there, the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you will take possession of it. He will make He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. You will, gain, you will again obey the Lord and follow all his commands I am giving you today. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the work of your hands. And in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your land, the Lord will again delight in you and make you prosperous, just as he delighted in your ancestors. If you obey the Lord, your God, and keep his commands and decrees that are written in this book of the law, and turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, what what I am commanding you to do today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it, nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea and get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death, and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live 
and increase. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call on the heavens and the earth as witness as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some intense stuff, isn't it? Did everyone follow all of that so I don't have to rehash it all? Stuck with me, okay. I want you to take inventory for a second. I want you to sit, genuinely think about this question I'm about to ask. I want you to answer it honestly, indoor thoughts. There's no sense in lying to yourself. There's no, like, there's no sense in because you're not raising your hand, we're not, everyone's not coming up here, you're not getting anything out of this. If you, if you tell a lie, if you say what you think I want to hear, this isn't about me, you need to think. Do you want to look like Jesus? Do you, do you actually want to be Christ-like? I've said for years, no one forced me into Christianity. I chose that path. I chose to be a Christian. I choose every day to try and be as much like him as possible. No one held a gun to my head. No one forced me into it. I doubt that anyone forced you into it. I've said that before. Do you actually want to look like him? Because if you do, there are things that have to change about each of us. Every single one of us has changes to make, changes to perspectives, changes to thoughts, opinions, all of those things sometimes have to change in order for us to look like Jesus. Are you with me? I cannot just do things the way that I want to do them and be like him. If I do, then I am like me, I'm not like him. So again, my question to you, do I want to be like him? I was created in the image of God. Do I want, do I want to be in his image? Do I want to look like him? Okay. Let me go to my notes. Because I wrote stuff down. When God created humanity... It was important to him, important to him, to give humanity free will. It wasn't a mistake. He did it on purpose. When God created humanity, it was important to him to give humanity choice. He did it on purpose. He did not make a mistake. Okay. This whole time that we talk, I want you to... First of all, I'd love it if everyone would just like relax and breathe. I need to relax and breathe. I feel very tense. Just hear what God has to say. I'm I'm just going to do my best here. It was important for him to give humanity a choice because God recognized that he could create humanity and force humanity 
to do what he wanted them to do. He could force them to be mindless creatures that just did exactly what he wanted them to do. If he did that, humanity would never actually love him. Because a love that is demanded isn't love. A love that is forced isn't love. Are you with me? He created humanity with choice so that each and every single person that is alive right now, that has ever lived, will ever live, will have the choice to love him. When he gave humanity that, he recognized that some would choose not to. You need to understand this. God Almighty created humanity knowing that some would say, I'm not going to love you. I'm not going to follow you. I'm not going to serve you. But he gave them an opportunity to say yes. Okay. If you look in John 14, real quick, John 14, verse 15, a very commonly quoted scripture. We actually talked about this. I, I quote it a lot. John 14, 15, Jesus is speaking, and he says, if you love me, keep my commands. Right? Chris, just leave that up for a second. Does everyone see that? What is the first word of that sentence? If. If. What does that mean? Jesus says, you can choose to do it or not. Jesus so, we talked about God. I asked you, do you want to be Christ-like? Jesus says, if you choose me, if you choose to love me, if, if you're going to do that, then you keep my commands. Keeping commands, we talk about this all the time, keeping commands is how I show God that I love him. Right? But he is saying, if you love me. You're not forced to. You don't have to. You get the choice. Each one of you sitting here right now, every single person watching online, every single person you've ever met and will ever meet has the choice to love him or not love him. It's their choice. You with me? I asked you the question, do you want to be Christ-like? Here's what I will say. Again, I'm going to read a lot because this is what God gave me. If I want to be Christ-like, I have to embrace other people's ability to choose how to live their lives. It doesn't mean I'll agree with their decisions any more than God agrees with all of my decisions, but I have to be okay with allowing them to choose. And I know, I know, I know that that is not an ear-tickling thing to hear. Because we are told as Christians that our job is to go and make disciples, right? right. And you are. But Jesus walked up to the disciples and he saw them doing other things and he simply extended an invitation for them to follow him. Come, follow me. They made the choice to go. The only reason that he could make them into disciples is because they chose to follow. He did not force them. He did not walk up to the fishermen and rip the nets out of their hands. 
He did not walk up to Matthew, the tax collector, and overturn his table and take away his calculator. And he did. He invited them to come. It was not him forcing them. He allowed them to choose. Judas walked with them for three and a half years and still chose to betray him. And Jesus allowed Judas to be there every step of the way. If I want to look like him, I have to get to the point where I allow people to make their own choices. Even if it doesn't agree with me, even if it's not how I think that they should live their lives. And I know, I get it, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about it in more depth in just a minute, but I need you to hear this part because it's important. I have to get to the point where I understand that other adults around me aren't going to do things the way I want them to do them and they are allowed to choose and I have to be at peace with their choice. Doesn't mean I have to like it, but I have to be at peace with the fact that they get to make it. I have to be. I'm going to read another note. Oh, this is a big one. If I only love and accept people when they make the decisions I want them to make, then I don't love them, I love me. Because I only love them when they look like me. Jesus, Jesus loves everyone. He gave his life for everyone. He didn't select and choose and say, okay, for this one I will, but for this one I won't. There were people that were in the crowd that day that he had ministered to, that he had given to. The very disciples who were, who were with him for three and a half years abandoned him, denied knowing him, betrayed him. He still loved them in spite of their choices to do something he didn't like. He doesn't just love you when you look like him. He loves you when you're filthy. He loves you when you're dirty. He loves you when you're actively choosing the wrong thing. He loves you when you're actively choosing the thing that put the nails in his hands. He loves you in spite of that. He allows you to make your choice. You with me? This is why forgiveness and mercy and love are such prominent themes in scriptures. Because if I only love someone else when they, when they do what I want them to do, then I don't love them, I love me. And it's fine for me to love me. The word of God says to love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's okay to love yourself. That's okay. A lot of churches nowadays, you can't love yourself or they're on the other end of that pendulum. You only love yourself. No, 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 no. You love God you love others and you love yourself. Those, all three of those things can be true. But if I only love someone else when they look like me, then I just love me. I don't love them. So many of us, so many Christians today in our world today want to try to force people into being what we think they're supposed to be. And we only love them, we only accept them, we only have open doors and open arms for them if they do what we want them to first. If they live the way that we think they should first. And God's love and mercy and forgiveness are prominently displayed through the scriptures as a way of helping you to understand you don't have to accept someone else's decision. You don't have to agree with their decision, but you have to give them the ability to make their decision. And if they're wrong, you forgive them. And if they're wrong, you love them anyway. And if they're wrong, you give mercy. It does not matter if they do it the way I think they should. I forgive. Because they have the right to choose the right to choose their own way. A 
Of course, of course, God wants people to choose to do what is right and live righteously, but his love is not contingent on them choosing correctly. It doesn't hang on that. He will love you regardless of what you choose. Do you want to be like him or not? When you see people choosing wrong, what does that do for you? Does it make you angry or heartbroken? I believe God's heart breaks. I believe it breaks when he sees someone choosing something that he knows will lead to death and destruction. So often we're quick to get angry because someone's not doing it the way we think they should. Because someone's making a choice to do something that we think is wrong. That we think they shouldn't do it that way. That we think will send them to hell. We're angry. We cut people off and we cut people out. We start using phrases, those kinds of people, people like that. Start clumping people together. And they're no longer individuals who Jesus laid his life down for. They're just this group of sinners over here that won't get their act together. That is not Jesus. It is not Jesus. Show me in the word where he goes up, and that's what he does. Show me in the word where he goes up to a group of people who are doing it wrong and just lays into them. He calls out the religious leaders of the day, the ones who say they speak for him, but are leading people further away from God because their own warped and twisted sense of who God is is breaking the society around them. He calls them out. If he were here today, if he were here today, what would he say to you? What would he say to you? I'm reminded... Oh, man, God, you're so good. It's right there. Reminded of the story in John chapter 8. Where a woman is caught in the act of adultery, and the religious leaders of the day bring her to Jesus to be stoned. We know this story, right? The religious leaders bring the woman before Jesus and say, the woman was caught in the act of adultery, she is to be stoned. Jesus looks at them and says, you who is without sin, cast the first stone. He bends down, he writes in the dust, right? The law was, the law was, the law Y'all hear the word I'm saying? The law was this transgression, this penalty. It wasn't a suggestion of the time. It, It wasn't a rule of thumb. It was the law. They based their entire lives around it how to live it. There were discussions on end, countless discussions, hours and hours and hours of debate a day, a day on how to live the law. What did it look like to live out the law? It was so important to them. The law, it was everything. They wrestled with it with each other, they, they, had the, they had these meetings and they would, they would talk about the most minute details. How many steps could you walk in a day? How many steps could you walk on the Sabbath day before it went from you're out for a walk to now you're working? Because we can't work on the Sabbath. You, the law, this, they lived and died by this thing. It was serious to them. 
And the law said, this woman caught in the act of adultery is to be stoned because of her crime, because of her sin, because of her transgression. That is what the law said. And Jesus says, let you, who has never done anything wrong, start the rock-throwing process. He was the only one there who had the right. Are you with me? He was the only one there that had the right. How does that exchange end? He bends down, he writes in the dust. When he finally looks up, everyone who had brought her there is gone. She is still there, not stoned. And he looks at her and says, women, or woman, where are those who condemn you? She says, they're gone. They're not here. What does he say back to her? The only one who had the right to condemn her. She had done wrong. She had broken the law. He had not done wrong. He had the right to condemn her. What does he say? Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. But then he says something else. Something that is another thing that Christians love to talk about Christians love to say, he tells her, neither do I condemn you. Then he looks at her and he says, go and sin no more. Right? Prayed about this a lot this week, guys, I'm telling you. Go and sin no more. Jesus understood that we have a choice. That she, that woman, had a choice. He could have condemned her. He could have stoned her. But he said, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Let me tell you this. Sin no more, sin no more is his desire. He desires for her to sin no more. His heart is go. Give it a second to sink in. His desire for her is to sin no more, to leave sin here forever, never pick it up again, never touch it again. That is his desire. But his heart is freedom. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? You sure? Are you sure that you understand that the heart of Jesus in this moment is I don't condemn you, I'm not taking your life from you, I am allowing you to be free to go from this place. My desire is that you won't do this again. My desire is that you don't do this again. Stop doing this to yourself. Stop. But whether you stop or whether you don't, you're free to go. Do you understand? Is that how you would respond to someone who didn't do life the way you think they should do it? The moment that I support Stripping someone of their God-given right to choose is the moment that I embrace bondage and not freedom. Well, that one's, that one's heavy. The moment that I support stripping someone of their God-given right to choose is the moment that I embrace bondage and not freedom. Because what I am doing is I am saying you are not allowed to do this. You are not allowed. That woman had a law that she was supposed to be living by. And when she is presented to Jesus in clear violation of the law, his response 
is, I am not holding you to account for that. Go. Please stop. You can go, but please stop. That is his response. We live in a world today where Christians tend to be the very loudest at trying to take away people's right to choose how to live their lives. We want people to live them by Christian standards. I get it. I understand that as Christians, we feel like our way is the best way. You're probably sitting there and you're like, yes, but, but if people do this, then this thing. And if people do this, then this thing. And if everyone would just see it the way that I see it, and if everyone would just do it the way that I think it needs to be done, and, or, or according to the, let me tell you this. Your way may be great. His way is perfect. God's way is perfect. If he isn't going to force his way on someone else, who do you think you are that you should? I, if y'all don't come back, I get it. I totally get it. But this is his word. As good as your way is, it ain't perfect. It ain't. You could be wrong. His ways are perfect. There is no error. There is no prejudice. His way is perfect. And if he isn't going to force you to live by his way, if he isn't going to force any other person to live by his way, then who do we think we are that we get to say, you can and can't do this? Here's what you are allowed to do. Here's what you're not allowed to do. Who do you think you are? What do you think gives you the right to live outside of the means of God himself? I know. I know. Let me say this. Three more points and I'm done. You should absolutely... Live the way that you feel is best, which hopefully is the way of Jesus. And you can certainly encourage people to live that way. But encouraging people and attempting to force them are two different things. Absolutely make your choice. Absolutely choose how you want to live your life. Joshua says, as for me and my household, you are allowed to make choices about what goes on under your roof. You can. You can make choices to say, in my house, this is how I will live. This is how my kids will live when they're in my house. My spouse, this, these are the, this is how we're going to do things. And in my domain and what I have control over, this is how we are going to do things. You can make that choice. But if you want the ability to make that choice, then give that choice to others. Because he gave it to you and he gave it to them. Are you, do you understand? I've got one more thing saying I'm done. But y'all need to hear this. I, I know a lot of people right now are probably mad at me. No, I know a lot of people right now in the Christian community who get very, 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 very upset, angry, fighting mad, if they feel like there is even talk, potential, an idea floated, they heard it on something, that someone somewhere might take away your right to serve God how you choose. Christians get, man, talk about get their panties in a bunch. That y Christians get fighting mad. If, if they even get a whisper, a hint, that there may be some law that won't allow their Christianity to continue the way they see fit. But we are also... Will make people mad. I know I am. Jesus, help me. We are also 
the absolute loudest voice in trying to strip other people of their choice on how to live their lives. Let me tell you why people don't like us. People didn't like Jesus because he was God. People didn't like Jesus because he always did what was right. And him even being in their presence exposed the darkness that was within. People don't like us because we think we're know-it-alls. And we try and control other people. People followed Jesus not because he controlled them, but because he invited them. People followed Jesus because they saw what love looked like and it was enticing. We got people running from the church today because Christians are pushing them out. I'm tired of pushing people away from Jesus. I'm just so tired. I'm just so tired of it. I can't do it anymore. I'm so tired of having conversations with people who tell me that they can't serve the same God that I serve because this one said this thing to them and this one made them feel this way. And Just stop it. Stop it. He allows us to have choice and he accepts our choice. Whatever that may be, whether it's to follow him or not, he accepts it. He doesn't He doesn't force you to change. He invites you to. He shows you what it could look like to do it differently. But he's not forcing people. He's not forcing you. He's not forcing anyone else. We have got to stop representing him that way. We have got to stop making people feel like they can't find love and acceptance at Jesus. In Jesus. The feet of Jesus. Because their choices are too bad. I asked you in the beginning, did you want to be like him? One last thing. I understand that we all want people to make better choices. I understand that if you're not, if if you're, maybe you're not personally, but maybe you know people who don't live for Jesus, you want them to do better. Trying to force them to is not the way. Because it's not his way. It's not what he does. Let me say this. In Joshua 24 and Deuteronomy 30, Moses and Joshua lay out all of the good things that God has done and will do for them. Y'all saw that, right? If they will choose. Moses says, today, for you, blessings, cursings, life, death, choose life. Joshua says, if you will choose him, if you will actually, Joshua even goes so far as to say, if it is undesirable for you to live for him, then go live for another God. That's fine. But just make a choice. Make a decision. If I want others to find him, it's not about me forcing them. Here's how I can do it. I choose Jesus. I allow God to bless me in my obedience and in honoring him through my sacrifices, so that others may see and choose to follow him too. I choose him. I understand that your neighbor's not doing it right. I understand that that person from high school, that your friend's on Facebook and they post things all the time that drive you nuts, I understand they're not doing it. I get it. I understand. I understand that you look around and you're like, this thing ain't right, that thing ain't right. I I get it. You choose him. You choose him. You choose him. It's not about how they choose. You choose him. Focus on you. Focus on your relationship with him. You choose him. As you choose him, he will bless you. As he blesses you, your life will become attractive. Your life will become attractive. Other people will want to know what is going on. They will have questions. At that time, You can present Jesus, the real Jesus, the Jesus you actually follow as evidenced by the fact that he's blessing you. But you choose him. You choose him. Parents of kids out there, young kids, 
I'm going to talk to the, the, the parents or even grandparents if you have a hand in raising young kids. You choose what happens and goes on in your household. Not the four walls, that it, but under your covering as parents. Okay? I understand that you may look at, I'm going to get real for just a second, I'm going to be done. I, I, was, I had no intention of doing this. God just gave me this, so y'all bear with me for just a second. I understand parents of young children or people, who, any caregivers of young children who have authority in their lives. I understand that you may look at the world around us, specifically the school systems around us, and you may disagree with things that go on inside of those school buildings. You have every right to raise your children the way you think they need to be raised. There are alternative educations to public schools. There are. They exist. Okay? If, if you would say, I recognize that there are alternative um, choices in education outside of public schools. I don't want my kids in public schools. I would like something else. But I don't know how. I don't know what the means are. I don't know what that looks like. Whatever. Please come talk to me. Please talk to me. Talk to mom, dad. Like, we will, we will help. We will do whatever we can to help point you in a positive direction, in, a, in, a, in, in the direction that you're wanting to go. Okay. If you choose to not allow certain things in your household and your kids are going to a school where those things are happening that you don't like, you absolutely can choose to say, I'm not going to allow my kids to be a part of this. You have that right to say, not my kids. Are you with me? Okay. You don't have the right to try and force other kids or other parents to do life your way. The world is the world for a reason. I should not be angry at the world for being worldly. But I set the standard of what goes on in my house. I set the standard for what I allow in my life. Other people will make choices. I cannot control that. If I want to be godly, I have to give them room to make choices, not strip them of them. Amen? Amen. Okay. I get that that was a, was a hard few minutes for some of you, maybe. Maybe not for all of you. But maybe. For... Here's the reality. I want all of us to look like Jesus to the best of our ability. If you're here, if, if you chose to come here today, and I gave, in fairness, I gave every single person an opportunity in the beginning to get up and leave. If you don't remember, I did. If you stayed, I'm assuming you stayed because you actually want to look more like him. Yes, yes. This, is what look, this is what looking like him looks like. You don't have to agree that that's the way that you should live. You don't have to agree. That's your choice, to not agree. But that is the reality of those scriptures. You don't have to like the fact that you should live that way if you want to represent him. But if I want to represent him, that is the reality of those scriptures. I make a choice. I'm able to make choices for my children, they are in my household. One day they won't be. Some of you, man, didn't know I was going to say this either. Some of you are more angry with your kids than you are anyone else. Because you raised them to know better. You think they should know better. You think they should do better. And every time they make a choice to go a way that's different than the way that you would go, it makes you so angry. Love, forgiveness, mercy. Yes, yes, yes. Love, forgiveness, mercy. Give them room. 
Give them room. Stop beating them down every single time. When the prodigal son returns, he doesn't get a lecture. He gets an embrace. That's what he gets. I promise I love you guys so much. I promise if, I, if anything in any of this felt condemning, that was Stephen, that wasn't God. God wants to correct. He wants to convict. He wants us to do better. I love y'all so much. I, it, is, it is so hard to have to say certain things, but when he tells me to say them, I will say them no matter what it costs me. I want to say one more thing, and then y'all can stand. We're, we're done. But I'm going to say this last thing because I, I, I felt impressed. There were two things that I felt impressed to say at the beginning and at the end of the service today. The first thing was that I wanted to give our pastors, who I do submit to as pastors, the authority to shut me down if I was wrong, which I did. The next thing I'm going to say is this. Typically, at the end of services, I will try and rush. Some of y'all are so ridiculously fast, it's impossible to get to you. But I try to rush over there as quick as I can to, to tell everyone bye, thank you for coming, have conversation with those who, who want to or feel like they need to or whatever. I will say this. I understand that there may be some things that I said today that you have questions about. Maybe there are some things that you're, that you're curious if I meant this or maybe I, you think maybe, oh, did he say it wrong or whatever, but you may, you may have something you want to say. Okay. I want to make myself available. So when service is over today, I will not, I'm going to stay right down here. And if you want, you don't, you don't owe me nothing. You ain't got to say nothing to me. You don't have to tell me good, bad, in between. Like seriously, you don't have to say anything. But if there's something that you want to say, especially if you have questions, especially if there are things where you're like, okay, I heard you say this, but I don't know. I, 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 I want to make myself available to be able to have conversation with you. Because I, I know that this was probably an incredibly challenging message to hear. I'm glad, like, y'all seem to have done okay with it. No, I didn't see any single person in here, like, shaking their head at me or fist at me. Or I, I mean, y'all all, y'all either sat completely still and stoic, a bunch of statues, or you were like, yeah, okay, get it, which is good. But if there is something, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't want anyone to leave feeling like I said something I didn't say or leaving with questions, with more questions than you got here with. The point of getting together is learning so that we can look more like him, not leaving confused. Amen? Does that make sense? So I wanna, I'm just going to make myself available. If no one says anything to me, that's fine. I'll go home happy. But if, if, you want, if there's something you need to talk with me about, I, I just want you all to know I'll make myself available. Okay. I'm just gonna say I'm just gonna say a quick prayer. We prayed earlier for those who, interestingly enough, mom just felt the call to say if if you haven't given your life to Jesus and you want to, if you want to make him the Lord of your life. So we did that earlier. Maybe you're rethinking that now of whether or not he is actually the Lord of your life. So we're just gonna take just a second and and just we're gonna pray together. Just search your heart. God, if I have, maybe you're not, maybe, maybe this message wasn't for you in the sense that like you already do this, you already allow people, you already give that room and that grace and that mercy and that love and that forgiveness. Maybe you're already doing all that, that's great. But if you are someone, if you are someone who is trying to force your choices onto someone else and you keep finding yourself hitting a wall, you don't, have to walk around with that bondage anymore. You can leave today and leave that at the altar and say, I am not going to continue to try and force my choices on someone else. You can set yourself free from that burden today. It's not a burden you should have been carrying around in the first place. Okay? So we're just going to pray really quickly and then we're going to go. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, God, we thank you for your word. God, we recognize how beautiful and precious and wonderful it is. There is nothing else like it. We are thankful that you have chosen to give us this collection of books that we are able to read to get to know you, to get to know your heart, 
to get to know your mind, to get to know who you are, to get to know your desires. Because the only way that I can look like you is if I know you, if I've seen you. So God, there are times in my life where I don't look anything like you, and I'm confronted with that reality today. God, there are things that I've been doing that are not like you. There are ways that I've been looking at this world and the people around me that are not like you. God, my eyes have been opened, and I see that in hell, and I am sorry. I am sorry for trying to force my choices, my beliefs onto others. That I have tried to, to coerce them or to, 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 to literally strong arm them into making the choices that I want them to make so that they will look like I want them to look. Because God, I have not loved those people. God, give me opportunities to invite people. Give me opportunities to show love. Give me opportunities to be a true reflection of who you are. But God, I am sorry that I have done this incorrectly. That I have made those choices to go after people who look different than me, who live life different than me. And I have chosen in my heart to hate them even, to be angry with them. God, forgive me. I don't want to be that person. Help me to be resolute in my decision to follow you. Today, Today, all of these things are set before us. God, I choose you. I choose life. I choose blessings. I choose the better thing. I, and I want to choose it every day. I want to choose you every day. No matter what's going on in the world around me, I choose you. No matter what anyone else is doing, I choose you. No matter how dark it may seem, I choose you. I choose you. Help me to make that decision. Help me to live that decision. Help me to live, live with the conviction of that decision every single day so that I can look more like you, so that I can be more like you, so that you have the opportunity, that you have the ability to bless me so that others may see the blessings in my life, so that others may see what you've done for me to give me that opportunity to share with them. Help me to be more like you. God, I pray blessings over your people, each and every person under the sound of my voice. I pray blessings. I pray, God, that they leave this place with a better knowledge of you, a better understanding of you, and that we actually start making some changes to what we're doing and how we're doing things so that we can represent you well in this world. You're not here anymore. You're gone but you gave us the Holy Spirit so that we can be filled with your presence so that we can be your representatives. So help each and every one of us in here to represent you well throughout this next week with everyone we come into contact with that we will point them to Jesus. We thank you, we love you, we honor you, we praise you. God, I am humbled by you. And I am in awe of you. Amen, amen.